And we're back with On the Record with Tiffany. So my special guests are Henry Cisneros and Mary Alice Cisneros. Um, so can you all tell us a little bit about, I know a lot's been going on, right, with your family, with COVID-19. Can you tell our listeners how COVID-19 has affected the two of you? With well, we... We had a, uh, a family experience with COVID-19, and I'll, I'll let Mary Alice speak to it, but we got a call one Friday evening in uh, late March from my son, John Paul, who said, I have had three terrible days. I didn't want to frighten you, but uh, starting on uh, Wednesday, uh, he said I had chills, fever, uh, had um, um, diarrhea and stomach issues, and he said, uh, I am pretty certain that what I had was COVID, but I had to get through it because I, I, I had to I get up in the middle of the night and change the bed clothes because the sheets were soaked with perspiration. Um, so on Friday of that week, the third day of this, he went mm -hmm. in and had uh, um, uh, the test and the test proved uh, a week later that he indeed was positive. It scared the life out of us. And we thought we would uh, go to uh, New York and bring him back. And he, it, there was just no easy way to do it because you couldn't fly if you were positive. I uh, bet you had to sit on Henry, Mary Alice, <laughs> to keep him from going. <laughs> well, from... <laughs> I, I, was ready, I was ready to go and pick him up, drive up and get him. But he said, hey, I'll just make you sick if I spend three mm -hmm. days in a car with you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. He said, I hate to make you come all this with distance and then you're going to be disappointed because I am not going anywhere. <laughs> so he was pretty brave about it and worked his way through it. Uh, a few months later, uh, I guess this was in May, uh, my doctor, with whom I have regular physical checkups, uh, on one of those checkups said, um, I actually have the test if you want to take it. Uh, I know you haven't had any symptoms. But if you want to have the test, we'll get it done. So he did the test that showed I didn't have uh, the coronavirus. But then he also did the blood test. Mm -hmm. And when the results came back from the blood test, they showed that I had the antibodies, which suggests that I had had it at some point. And uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, there's nothing I could do. I, I, I was negative at the time, but it appears that maybe back in February, when I had been in New York and been around Chump Hall, uh, that I had uh, had a mild case. I do remember a couple of days where I felt just utterly exhausted. I had no words to describe. I mean, I came in to uh, uh, our apartment there uh, after a day of work and didn't even make it to change my clothes. I just fell on the bed and just, you know, felt like I just didn't have any energy to move. I'm frequently tired like that in New York because it's a grind, but this was, <laughs> this was this was different. So that's kind of our experience with it. Let me just turn this over to Mary Alice, but say in closing that I think we have to take this very seriously. Yeah. Even I, who have the antibodies or had, because they, they go away, uh, there's, there's no evidence that once you've been infected, you could not be infected again. In fact, right. there's, a, there, there's some belief that if you get it again, it's going to be worse the second time. Uh, also, we don't know what the COVID virus does once it's in your body. It can hide in your body and find another time to assert itself. So uh, this it is, is a, a very, novel virus. And vicious, that's what novel means. You know? Vicious disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would just say, Given the disproportionate impact on African Americans and Latinos all across the country, because we have been the essential workers, the people who were needed to stay on the job to keep the society functioning in the grocery stores, in the transportation system, doing the mechanical work for, for energy and power and other essential services, cleaning buildings, cleaning homes, um, uh, we have to be especially careful because uh, this is nothing to trifle with. And when you consider the underlying conditions that many in the African-American community and Latino community have related to diabetes, for example, 
or blood pressure or other other underlying conditions. Um, this is not a uh, a matter to be taken lightly. It is life and death. Amy. Yeah, I was thanking the frontline uh, workers. Yes. Uh, both in hospitals, the nurses that have been there 24 hours and then mm -hmm. still, you know, with the possibility of passing it on to their own children and families at home. So they're to us, you know, uh, such an important critical uh, workforce that have hung in there. Even doctors we know that have passed away, that have caught it and, yeah. and passed away. Of course, we want to thank the the science of the COVID-19 with Dr. Fauci keeping us alerted to the mutations that this COVID-19 has now taken and how the masks are most important for us to wear. So in our family, we, we do this thing. We greet one another on a Sunday Zoom uh, call to our grandkids and make sure we go down the list to check off that everybody's wearing their mask and being careful and <laughs> their hands extra extra for all that we are going through and sustaining what we thought was going to be a 70 day and now we're up to the next plateau here so uh, we will hang on until we find that vaccine and that's what we're praying for you know there are so many things that we can do as uh, americans and as a as individuals and one of those things is uh washing our hands practicing right. social distancing, following the guidelines that Dr. Fauci and uh, that, that others have set forth for us because we should remember that Dr. Fauci and the National Institute of Health, uh, they have spent their entire careers preparing for this. They have worked. They have thought through the models. They have toiled. And to say that they are more than uh, ready and equipped is true intellectually. This is a novel virus, so what they say about it will change over time as they gather more information regarding it. Those are not mm -hmm. mistakes. Those are simply the nature of finding out about a new virus. Correct. You know, and we, we have... We have the best. We simply have to follow what they're telling us to do. <laughs> and Tiffany, you have a special vantage point here. We followed your work with the Texas uh, Kidney Foundation uh, and uh, your, the way it interfaces in uh, African-American and Latino communities uh, that things that start with uh, uh, difficult and inadequate uh, nutrition that convert mm -hmm. themselves to problems of diabetes, uh, of, of obesity, for example, which then becomes diabetes, and diabetes uh, continues on to become a kidney disease. Yes. Uh, and and when it does, then the whole bodily system begins to break down and lends to literally as a terminal disease. People die. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, and it's a long and difficult kind of death. So we know the problems caused in minority communities by the lack of equity in our health system, lack of insurance, lack of ability to access clinics and doctors and early diagnoses so things become worse. We know how that is in our communities. And COVID-19 has exploited some of those weaknesses and done its damage disproportionately with African-Americans and with Latinos. It's not right. I mean, this whole subject of inequality in America uh, sounds almost like an abstraction. You know, we, 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 yes, we know it's unequal, but what can you do? Yes, we know it's unequal, but we live with it. But when we see it sort of thrust upon us, as this virus has done, and we see people dying, we see people on ventilators, we see people in hospitals, we see people who, whose family has to leave them at the hospital door because the hospital is so quarantined that once we turn them over at the door, may never see them again. And that uh, is terrible for us because in our communities, yeah. closure, we hold, we hold each other's hands through the, the worst of it. 
Yeah. And, and that is it's just so hard. Fair. Mm -hmm. But the unfairness is not the virus itself. The unfairness is some of these conditions that we as a society have set up yeah. that, 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 that result in disproportionate impact and that result in inability of money to handle it and result in inadequate public systems of health in our communities. So we have a long way to go. Uh -huh. And this, this virus has really showed us that. I'm very proud of our local leaders, Mayor Nuremberg and uh, Judge Wolf for really not just focusing on the immediate daily heartbreak of the virus, they're doing that well, but also focusing on what have we learned from this? How are we gonna change some things about our city? How are we gonna set some examples for the rest of the society to change fundamentally the access to income, to healthcare, uh, to, to, to regular diagnoses, uh, so that we we don't have to go down this road again. This has been a wake-up call it really for America. Been. It really has been, and especially about those social determinants of health that you just right. described. Because yeah. uh, as one one day in a in a very eloquent conversation that that uh, I had with your beautiful wife Mary Alice, she said, "Kidney disease is the last stop on the unhealthy train." That was that was your statement. And I thought, she's exactly right. The first stop is obesity and diabetes. But the first stop really is obesity. Well, um, even before obesity, mm -hmm. there's mal the, you know, uh, inadequate nutrition. That's right. Food, food deserts. And that's, and that's what I was thinking about. So what leads to that? Food deserts. You can't, lack of transportation. You can't get to where the good food is. Correct. You can't get to where uh, you need to go in order to to uh, just have a regular checkup. Well, and the you stores know. and the stores are not in our neighborhoods because the incomes are low in those census tracts, so you don't get the quality fruits and vegetables, right. and fresh materials and such. So people go to the corner store that's got the sweet drinks and the Cheetos and the. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 that's a poor substitute for for a good diet. You know, we the, one of the first things that uh, when COVID nineteen hit, and I started really thinking about, okay, what 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 is God trying to tell us? Because <laughs> when I'm I'm praying through this stuff and trying to think through what what should we, as a society and as a people and as a world, what what is this unveiling? You know, and one of those things is that is what we put our emphasis on. Put so much emphasis on money and on wealth and and mm. and that sort of achievement when uh, the very people that were saving our lives were the janitors mm. and the uh, the the grocery store clerks and the bus drivers and the folks that that uh, affect those social determinants of health that we're just that we're talking about. And I thought. Mm. Uh, we've got to change, and yeah. including my organization. And so we got together, our board, and made some good decisions <laughs> that, for our community, one of which is that we'll be following those patients that have uh, been di are in recovery from COVID-19 to monitor their kidney health. The other is how we would be able to, uh, how we would, would give uh, free testing for kidney disease so that people can can um, can arm themselves with yes. the knowledge of what's happening with their health. Um, well, I think to answer your question, you know, what is what is the Lord trying to tell us? Far be it from me to know what the Lord. I know, right? To say, <laughs> we have to listen very carefully. Mm -hmm. But I, but I think it, it probably has to do with the slowing down. Yeah. The pace of society and being more attentive to the fundamentals like like good food and yeah, like exactly. uh, a, a balanced life and like you know self uh, uh, self medic self attention to our 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 bodies and and uh, we're, we 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 we've been living some artificial existence for a long time and it's, exactly. and it's little by little getting it more complicated and created systems which uh, Unfortunately, uh, 
those who, who can afford the very best of things uh, can survive these things, and others who have to live at the margins don't. And that's not right. It's not. It's not right because basic human rights are being violated. Exactly. Like the uh, decency of a home, like the health care, like the quality of a job and the, and the stress of a job and the pay of a job. Uh, so um, we have a lot we have a lot to act upon and and I think maybe the Lord took mercy on us by giving us this warning sign that uh, things could be worse the next time. I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you on on every point and that and this warning sign was was to make us realize, we have got to change and and open up uh, opportunity. Yeah. The least of these. Absolutely. You know, it, it's always been about supporting and caring for the least of these. When, you know, I, you I, get I feel a great, like like going back to your point earlier about John Lewis, we yep. we made some major strides. America was very, very, very wrong in obviously slavery right. and then Jim Crow and then uh, inadequacy of economic rights and so forth in the 1920s. By the uh, 40s, uh, after World War II, there began to be some understanding that we owed something to the minority people who patriotically fought for the country and that opened up things like the GI Bill and education. Mm -hmm. But it was the civil rights movement then and President Johnson's Great Society that really brought us to the point where you may say we may have reached the height of our awareness, the height of our sensitivity to passing the voting rights law, to passing the Civil Rights Act, to passing the education programs that we did and the housing programs and creating the department, which I ended up at heading, HUD, built, you know, developed in 1965. That era was a height of response to the unfinished agenda of the United States. But, but we have steadily through the 70s and 80s and 90s and now in this century allowed our, our sensibilities to erode, our sense of decency, our sense of ideals to erode. I suspect we're more deeply divided now than we were then, 60s, I suspect we are more uh, calloused to the inequalities. I suspect we are living with um, uh, a, a kind of a cynical disrespect for each other that is corrosive. Uh, and mm. those, I think, are things that we have to, to really address. Or the result is unfairness, a biased system, a... Uh, uh, inequality of income and wages. Uh, we're going down the wrong road. We've got to step back a few notches, find that fork in the road, and go down the other road again. <laughs> right. Uh, because this one is going is getting us to no. uh, a cliff we're about to walk off on. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, you know, when I look at this, there are so many things that on both sides that are the same. People want the same thing. They want they want good jobs. They want to be able to take care of their families. They want to have have the have a, a lovely home that they get to live in. Yet we're in this quagmire of arguing and and pulling back and forth at one another and, and picking each other apart when that is not uh helpful at all. In well our we really need to get a handle on that because the times are gonna get more difficult not mm -hmm. easier. Climate change and where it's headed, it's going to have its own basket of problems. I'm afraid some of the leadership we have in the country today that is not leading in the world has left the vacuum. And other countries like Russia and China are going to try to walk into that vacuum. So our children are going to face some very real threats, including national security and even war on the horizon. Uh, we have issues like pandemics. We know now how they can spread and how how pernicious the virus itself is to be able to, as Mary Alice said, mutate, change, beat us, uh, even with a vaccine. And we're not assured this is the last virus. 
Well, it, it clearly is not. Exactly. Definitely not. There will be many more to come mm -hmm. in the years to come. Uh, and then we are going to lose our, 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 our role as a strong economic force um, if, if, if we don't educate our children, if we don't provide training. So we have some very, very difficult things to do, which would be difficult even if we were all together. Exactly. Divided, we don't have a chance. Exactly. So, so, so we got to deal with this question of mutual respect and, and, and ending some of the divisions if we want to have even a chance of dealing with these massive existential problems that our world is going to confront, is confronting, and most definitely is going to confront. Thank you so much for coming and for, for uh, being willing to talk with us. Henry and Mary Alice Cisneros. Uh, your insight is always always so helpful. Uh, and what you just said about us having to, we have to come together. That is what the United States was built on. The fact that we, that's why we were called the melting pot, because we have the ability to come together. We just need uh, leaders that are asking for us to come together and that are leading us to actually come together. You know, leadership can provide unification. Leadership should, should unify and not divide. And that's what we're going to have to, to uh, put into practice is picking. Some Tiffany, thank you for uh, having us and thank you for, um, the work that you do, not just in your day job at the Kidney Foundation, <laughs> but then using your persona, your personality, your effervescence, your charm, uh, your energy to uh, educate people in using this platform of this show. Uh, every 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 word that that uh, comes from you is a uh, is a word of hope, is a word of possibilities, is a word of uh, excitement. And uh, we need more of that electrical charge, uh, that, that source of power in our, in, in our community. Yes, thank you so much, Tiffany. Not only because you care enough, not only because you've been through it yourself and your family have been through kidney uh, diseases, but you care enough to come out to our community, the Latino community, and say, let's do something about it. And I, I treasure your friendship and continue to ask that you come back. Thank oh, you. Oh, I will. I treasure your friendship too. And you all have a wonderful week. And to my listeners, you've been listening to On the Record with Tiffany and Henry and Mary Alice come back anytime. I want an update and we can talk about what's going on in, in, uh, in our country and how we can make it better. Anytime you want to. <laughs> Thank, you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you.